So, how about that Sonic Frontiers, huh? Love it or hate it, at least it's a dozen times better than this shiz. And yes, that is all I have to say about that. For now. Anyway, where were we? Oh, that's right, I was screeching into the void about how terrible a Sonic game is. Well, might as well finish that up, eh? But it has been a long time since we did this, so let's get you folks all caught up. Welcome back to me screaming. <laughs> Disgusting! Fucking thing sucks! And you might know him, who they call <laughs> That's the best thing I've heard- No, it's not! <laughs> Ran out of juice. Well, I'll get more. Lots more. And then I won't just control one little punk, but the whole universe. Don't have much time. Don't have much time. Don't have much time. <laughs> Bitch, I don't give a fuck. <laughs> I don't give a fuck. Begging your pardon, Squire, but me and my mate are gonna sail off and search for that lover Sonic. You ever shut the fuck up? In conclusion. Why are you, you? Why? Why? Why do you insist on being stupid? After once again choosing to make jokes at the expense of several thousand innocent lives, Norman decides to join in on the fun to the sentient saw squid's chagrin, and the two have a laugh about... No. No, 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 please, no. Remember, ladies and gentlemen, try the newest dining experience here at Eggman's incredible interstellar amusement park, the Bucket of Sushi. Now with fish. Ugh, like I was saying. Well, I'm totally pleased, and a little nauseous. I grabbed a bite at the bucket of sushi. No, 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 no! <laughs> this again. We're, we're doing this again. We're making a joke at the expense of literally everything again. A freaking gin. Why do you do this to me, game? I just got back, for God's sake. What, what have I done to deserve this cruel and unusual neon rainbow-flavored punishment? Oh, come on. Saj, you nitpicking picker of nits. It's just a joke. Why are you reacting so dramatically? What, we can't have any jokes in the game now? Grow a sense of humor, you humor deficient degenerate. Well, my elegant but less than astute friend, I'm glad you asked that because it's a perfect segue to yet another comedy criticism tangent. As I've said previously, a joke that comes at the expense of characters, plot, and world building is always an objectively bad joke. And yes, I know I just said the word objectively in reference to a joke, which is a big no-no as most people would have you believe. But again, and you really should take a look at those previous parts if you've forgotten, because as stated previously, comedy is not completely subjective. Oh, what's that newcomers? Y you don't believe me? Well, let me explain what I mean. There is a difference between comedy and humor. Comedy is the overall genre, style, or category that focuses on comedic stories and heavily relies on many different kinds of jokes and laughable situations. Humor is the quality of being amused by something or finding something comedic for that individual. Humor is inherently subjective. It is what makes you personally laugh or feel amused. But comedy is not inherently subjective. It's actually inherently objective, much like the other genres, styles, or categories that stories fall into. Take the horror genre, for example. It's meant to be scary and suspenseful and to disturb or frighten the audience. But if a particular horror movie doesn't scare you specifically, that doesn't magically remove it from the horror genre, 
it just means you are particularly not disturbed or frightened or horrified by the specific piece of media in this genre. The work still has all the horror elements in it that identifies it as a work of horror, which we can easily identify, but you simply didn't receive the subjective effect that the work of horror was trying to instill in you. It can still succeed in implementing the horror elements of the story, but you personally can remain unmoved by it on a subjective level, which is fine, nothing wrong with that, everyone's tastes are different. However, when horror media fails to execute the horror elements it presents properly, and fumbles at making a lick of sense or runs completely on contrivances, contradictions, and plot holes aplenty, well now we've got a problem outside of what is personally doing it for each individual in the audience. A horror story is still a story. It needs to adhere to internal consistency, logical progression, and maintain the fundamental concepts of what makes a story. It doesn't matter if it personally scares you. As a story, it needs to function properly. When it establishes rules, it has to abide by those rules. When it presents characters with motivations, those characters must be consistent with their motivations. When it deposits a theme, it needs to support and define that theme. All of this is separate from whether or not it scares a person, and the same is true for all other genres. Which brings us back to comedy and this failed abortion of a joke in particular. It has failed to remain consistent with the characters, world building, and events that transpired in this game and in this series as a whole. It's created a massive hole in the plot that cannot be ignored nor excused, and it obliterates the little world building we had left in this abysmal bleach stain of a story. Whether it makes you personally giggle or not is irrelevant to how it fits into the logical progression of the story. And baby, it just doesn't fit into logical or progression at all. So to reiterate, because I want to be crystal clear on this, I am not saying you cannot find this joke hysterical. By all means, laugh if it tickles your funny bone. What I am saying is this joke is poorly constructed and breaks everything in the story for no reason, and thus, it is an objective issue with the story. Regardless of who laughs at it and who doesn't, this is badly written, and it severely damages the script as I will now make clear. The Bucket of Sushi utterly incinerates the intelligence, competency, and characterization of Jake and Norman, and the lack of utilization of the Bucket of Sushi to incapacitate or kill Jake and Norman is a fatal blow to Robotnik's characterization. Norman, a super genius prodigy with a bitter rivalry and hatred for Robotnik, who is currently helping Jake foil his plans, decides to eat his food at Bucket of Sushi. What? what? He chooses to eat food that Robotnik has provided to him, especially in light of the PA announcements concerning the specific food that he chooses to consume? Huh? Plus, Norman choosing to abandon Yakker in the middle of enemy territory in order to grab some suspect sushi directly leads to Yakker's disappearance. We'll, we'll, we'll come back to that in a second here. The Bucket of Sushi establishment treats Norman as a normal customer instead of treating him like the enemy he is. Every other spot in this amusement park treats them as enemies, except this one the one that would be the most advantageous for the big chungus to be antagonistic towards his enemies. If Robotnik gave instructions to whatever badniks work at the Bucket of Sushi to poison the food on the off chance Jake or Norman goes there, then Norman would be poisoned and unable to move properly. Jake would have to look for him, 
take care of him and get an antidote or something, which would completely derail the entire story. The sushi being awful enough to make Norman's stomach hurt a little bit, but not enough to give him food poisoning or regular poisoning because it's Robotnik's food being given to his sworn enemy, makes absolutely no sense and is supremely contrived. There's no reason why it wouldn't be poisoned intentionally to kill him. The fact that Norman could even get to the bucket of sushi alone, despite being in enemy territory surrounded by hazards and enemies, and Norman in this game is 100% incapable of taking care of himself, makes no sense whatsoever. Which, yes, that's inconsistent with his characterization in previous games, but him being 100% incapable of taking care of himself is consistent with this game's portrayal of him. So either he's inconsistent with his current portrayal in this game, which is horrifically stupid, or he's inconsistent with his portrayal in previous games, which is stupefyingly horrific. Both entirely breaks the character and plot. Feel free to pick your favorite. Jake doesn't get sushi despite him being the one to openly admit that he really wants some, with the added detail of his character in this game being obsessed with wasting time on frivolous nonsense and satisfying himself at the expense of others. Just repeatedly hitting us over the head with contrivance and contradiction one after the other in such a short span of time. I'm getting PTSD flashbacks of the robot arm puncture scene. If Norman doesn't get sushi and Jake, because he voices his desire to have sushi, gets it instead, then he would get sick and that would significantly handicap his abilities. This would free Robotnik to continue his evil plan and the mind control cannon would blow up still. However, Robotnik would be able to escape and try again, while Jake and Norman would struggle to get away from the black hole. The wisps that are still captured would most likely die while the rest of the wisps futilely try to defuse the black hole, and then everyone would die. If Norman didn't abandon Yankee to get sushi, then Yapper wouldn't have disappeared in the middle of the story, and that would significantly change the rest of the story. Which... Yeah, Norman abandons Yatter, and that leads to Yakatori getting kidnapped off screen. Somehow. Yakima is just gone. He doesn't follow Norman, or if he did, Norman just ignored his pleas. Or the method in which he was captured was so ingenious that Yakuza couldn't cry for help at all. It's very vague and stupid because it happened off screen, conveniently because the writers wanted to have their cake and eat it too. But the problem is they're too incompetent to eat cake. So we get the messy remains of someone violently mashing a cake and smearing it all over the wall. As per usual, might I add. In short, the Bucket of Sushi joke can't work even remotely and it shouldn't even exist in the script because it's just a throwaway joke anyway. It's not even a major gag that's supposed to come back in any way or plays a major role in Norman's, Jake's, Yukon's, or Robotnik's characterization. Well, it does play a major role in their characterization, but not in the way the writers intended. It's just so freaking bad on every level, and I don't know how anyone can defend it because, good Gloria Borger, it makes me want to escape my entire existence. But alas, we've got an entire third act to get through, so the existential release will have to wait a while longer. Like two hours longer or something. I don't even know. Let's just get through this nightmare piss. So after that horrifying experience that someone callously labeled a scene, we jump to a scene that immediately puts this slow-paced, non-sequitur, lollygagging, bad joke-telling, flippant bullcrap into perspective. What is this place? Whoa. This is where he converts them into the strange, negative aliens with the freaky energy. Oh, there you are. I thought I lost you for a second. Did you find anything interesting? Look at all of them. He's captured thousands of aliens. Don't worry. We'll get them out. Sonic, I haven't seen Yakker for a while. You'll have to excuse me, buddy. I have a generator to shut down. It's about freaking time you two stop telling lame crap jokes. Finally, 
we have some actual goddamn stakes properly conveyed, and the characters are being serious. It's only now that I realize just how exhausting it is to follow a story where the protagonists are always meta, self-absorbed, cocky buttholes. Nothing mattered to these flaming pieces of tarred until this scene, which is literally just before the penultimate boss of the entire game. So it essentially took the entire game for stakes to be properly conveyed and for the heroes to take those stakes seriously despite knowing them from the get-go. Yeah, I think I'll go ahead and commit regicide now, thanks for that. This scene still isn't good, by the way. I mean, first and foremost, Norman only now realizes that Yucatan is gone. That Cyclops jellyfish has been gone since you went to Planet Wisp, which was three planets ago, in case you forgot. And Norman has literally been doing frick all this entire time, because once again, he doesn't do anything of importance at all. He even admits to dicking around and eating sushi, provided to him by their sworn enemy who is currently trying to kill them. I'm sorry, I, I'm i still not over that. I, I still can't believe that actually happened. So how could he have lost Yakaruna if he had absolutely nothing else to do but converse with it and read off the words the thing says to him? But what is Jake's response to this horrifying turn of events? What the heckle shekel is that about? Don't you want to, I don't know, Free these cosmic jellyfish that you are currently witnessing being drained of their life force before your very eyes? Do you at least want to try calling out to Yapper, see if he's still in this mass of tortured aliens? Do you even give a crap about Yadel? Because you have a total non-reaction when Norman informs you that Jaeger has nowhere to be found for a long time. It genuinely seems like Jake doesn't give a single spit about Yabba Dabba Doo, someone he claims in the very next scene is his friend. What kind of moron caused this limp pretzel posing as a story? Not to mention this is an excellent moment for Norman to do something, anything of worth, and he does absolutely nothing. He could try to examine the machinery and find a way to reverse the effects of the weird flying squigglies. He could try to find a way to free them from their imprisonment. He could be blasting his way through the place while Jake finds the generator and fights the boss. I mean, there doesn't appear to be any security here whatsoever, so there's no danger of getting caught or hurt, and you have every reason to attempt to do something to save these innocent creatures. So what does Norman decide to do? Friggin' stand there, whimpering like a barely sentient Funyun. You are not Tails, you gangrene-infested whore's anus. You have every reason and every chance to be competent and contribute something, yet you actively choose to remain useless and ineffectual. Commit Sudoku and be gone, you dookie dunk dipstick. Yeah, that's right. I'm stretching. You got a problem with that? I want to be able to fully enjoy taking you apart without some pulled muscle slowing me down. Okay, now I'm ready. Of course, if you want to run away, please feel free. There's no shame in it. Well, maybe a little shame. Shut up, bitch! The god damned edgelord blimp can't choose to give up, you insipid, sweltering nub. Just beat it up and destroy the generator so you can save the dying innocents that you just left to die. Stop dragging your oversized feet and get on with it, you insufferable cobalt cock. Why are you like this, game? Just why? Because we're bigger. And life is a fucking nightmare. And there goes the blood vessel. Jake finally kills the edgelord blimp, and upon his return, Norman praises him for his minimal effort. Couldn't have done it without you, buddy. Lies, lies, all lies. Then they proceed to spend the next 60 seconds talking about how much they deserve a freaking reward after today's debacle. <sighs> 
The only thing you two deserve is the goddamned electric chair at this point. You have been horribly incompetent and disrespectfully slow about rescuing the Technicolor tapeworms and their worlds and protecting your own from imminent enslavement. You're both sorry excuses for heroes, and I wish you nothing but the deaths. This brings up an interesting point. Is this really the right mindset for a hero to have? Only doing good because of the prospect of gaining some reward afterwards? And doing good in the most lackadaisical, farcical, and flippant way possible, cracking ridiculous jokes and singing your own praises the whole way? Totally disregard the limited time that you have to waste as you leisurely walk around openly admiring the work of the sadistic villain behind this entire catastrophe? Take no real care or consideration that every second you utterly waste, innocent lives are lost, and once pristine planets are irrevocably corrupted and it's 100% all your fault? Is this truly the behavior of a hero worthy of any reward? Ah, uh, I think the fuck not, you trick ass bitch! These two creatures are some of the absolute worst protagonists in the history of fiction. They are an utter embarrassment and are overwhelmingly insufferable in every scene they're in. They actively choose to be incompetent in order to prop themselves up and revel in the misfortune and pain of their enemies. They gloat callously joke, get caught up and distracted by the most minor of things, and waste even more time on frivolous flights of fancy when the fate of their entire world, five other worlds, and potentially the universe hangs in the balance. It doesn't get much worse than that. And right now, I just need this to be over. Jake destroys the generators, the hologram chains are fading away, and... wait... Why don't the chains fade away when he destroys a respective planet's generator? What's keeping all of the planets attached to the chains? Do you literally have to destroy all five or nothing happens at all? Why? Why and how? Oh, sorry, forgot lazy mode. Chains are gone, oversized sperm worms are free now. No, we don't have time to focus on all of the dead cosmic jellyfish that our dismal duo failed to save because they were being supremely obnoxious lumps of syphilis, and we get to this baffling moment. We did it, dude! We? I don't remember you fighting off any insane robots. Really, bitch? You can't even be consistent with your own shiz. You have Got to be kidding me. He literally just said, Couldn't have done it without you, buddy. And, Great job, buddy. You said this. I didn't say it, and I sure as tits don't agree with it. But you said it. These scenes just happened. These are the two scenes immediately before this one. How on earth did this moment stay in the final script? For the love of Sacagawea. It's bad enough that you've completely ignored, destroyed, or contradicted the characters we all know and love from the previous games, but now you're contradicting your own bullcrap. We ventured even deeper into the garbage heap than I thought was possible. You can't have it both ways, you tank top troglodytes. Either Jake believes Norman is a valued partner in this story, or he knows the truth about this useless cardboard cutout and is calling him out in the worst way possible. Neither option is good, but trying to straddle the fence is the worst decision you could possibly make. Pick one and stick to it, you gallon of goosenecks. True. Well, good job to you on inventing a translator that allowed us to speak to the aliens and figure out exactly what- Mm-hmm, got it. Just a quick- FYI, you both have been wandering around the whole park like idiots this entire time. From the beginning of this freaking rusty walnut some people generously call a story, you two have been walking around as if you have all the time in the world, failing to be witty, clever, or heroic. You seriously need to rethink your entire state of being, you knockoff Hamburglar sidekick. And let's not forget that one moment just recently where you could have finally done something and made yourself semi-useful, but you took a friggin' nap standing up and let the cosmic jellyfish suffer even longer than necessary. Which logically would lead to the death of hundreds of them, if not thousands. You are superfluous. 
Wake the hell up, you bruised, leather-bound butterball. Good lord, take me now, initiating lazier mode. Robotnik attempts to salvage his embarrassing display throughout this entire game by revealing his super ultra mega mind control ray is fully charged, while the wonder twits murder the very concept of meta commentary for a full three minutes. However, because Robotnik forgot to install basic troubleshoot and software maintenance into this futuristic space conglomerate, the random robot arm that shouldn't have done anything to this massive thing causes the whole thing to explode into a black hole. No, this doesn't harm or immediately endanger any of our characters, nor the world this is all connected to, because once again, this script is allergic to stakes logic, and reason. And no, I do not know why a mind control ray malfunction has created the slowest black hole in existence. I, d it's like, I don't, I don't have any answers for you on that one. Oh, look, a reference to a far better Sonic game. That's, uh, it's, um, <laughs> why though? Lemon Brick belittles Robotnik, making me question every decision that has led me to this moment in my life, but more importantly, it highlights just how detrimental to Robotnik's character this game is. The fact that Lemon Brick is still alive after this moment is baffling. Why on earth would Robotnik allow this insubordinate behavior from a subordinate? One he programmed to be subservient to him. Oh, it's because funny joke. <laughs> Silly me. <laughs> Lol, keck. <laughs> what a riot. I'm in desperate need of relief from this comic relief. Robotnik shifts to plan B while Jake and Norman remain frozen on the spot as the far more intelligent sentient saw squids fly for their lives. Then Jake proceeds to take a dump on the corpse of meta commentary that Circle Thing and Square Thing already murdered. I got a bad feeling about this. Good, so it's not just me. When I feel the ground shaking under my feet and see plumes of dust rising and rubble tumbling and aliens running for their lives, yeah, I get a bad feeling. Yeah, that's not funny. Uh, this isn't joke time. This is running to the space elevator time. Hey, look, Norman did do something useful. He shut Jake up. Twice! But after an entire game of Jake's painful hemorrhage-inflicting comedy routine, he's a day late and a dollar short. Especially since it took them a whole 35 seconds to just run for the dang exit. Common sense and logical behavior is thrown out of the window to fit in more jokes. Perfect sense of priorities. I'ma add a genocide to that regicide. Honestly, if this scene wasn't even here, it would have helped the story significantly. So of course they left it in, can't have quality and decent pacing showing up in this thing. E Ew. <laughs> Robotnik tries to join in on the cringe comedy routine, but Jake tells him there's only room for one self-satisfied, incessant douche pasture on this stage, and Robotnik thankfully agrees. Norman admits he doesn't know if they can defeat Robotnik now, considering He's powered by the energy from your little brain! Which implies that this machine is capable of doing the mind control trick from before, right? Because that's literally the only thing that he's created that is powered by hyperdonita fluid, and it worked fine on these two before, thus making it extremely difficult for both Jake and Norman to defeat him in time to escape the imminent desolation. Yeah. Okay, this could be interesting. Robotnik has finally done something smart and is a credible threat for Jake. So this is gonna make up for all of that rampant stupidity that fueled the rest of this musty clam pile, right? Lol, nope. Jake pushes Norman onto the elevator that he has no idea will actually send him back to the planet safely, doesn't know if it will even move considering the whole planetary structure is shaking, but... He has to seem like a hero at least once before this game ends, so lol, shovey shovey. And Robotnik just sits there quietly and lets him do this. What a gentleman. Insert stupid final boss that doesn't use the mind control ray at all because I guess Robotnik just kinda uh, forgot about it. He's had a lot to deal with today. He can't be asked to remember the sole reason he built this entire galactic complex. He also decides to not explode the entirety of the platform that Jake is running on to defeat him. Cause if he did do that, Jake would have a very rough time defending himself, let alone defeating Robotnik and surviving the massive black hole. Robotnik doesn't do this because his brain has been replaced with used muffin wrappers, which snaps the entire game in half again. 
but that's totally fine. It's not like we need stakes or a serious threat in our story's climax, am I right? Robotnik gets sucked into a black hole, but not before mocking himself, because even he can't respect himself in this unholy script of ineptitude. The narcissistic megalomaniac who constantly praises himself and boasts about his greatness mocks himself as he's snatched away to his potential demise. Uh, I think that just broke my brain. Jake, despite facing imminent death and destruction, as well as his entire planet's desolation thanks to the proximity of a black hole to it, still refuses to take it seriously and slips in one more fourth wall comment to really kick that corpse while it's down. Uh, amazing. Reality sets in for just one minute as Jake fails to outrun a black hole and is fading away into the cold, unknown depths of the cosmic anomaly, ending this whole thing on a somber yet cathartic note. Which we can't have because this game is all about them good vibes, yo. So the extraterrestrial blowpins magically save Jake by displaying their ability to be immune to black holes. Let me say that again because I don't think you fully understand what that means. These little aliens that have been portrayed as helpless little creatures in need of rescue, soft, weak life forms that were overtaken by a simple robot army, small, defenseless babies who only have substantial power when in service of other beings, but never for themselves. These itty bitty merchandising excuses shrug off the effects of a freaking black hole in order to save Jake, the guy who took his sweet anus time rescuing them and actively focused on cracking cringe jokes instead. And the hernia has begun to form. Excellent. Then they go back up to space, uncorrupt the messed up Technicolor tapeworms, which is... Mmm, um, no. No, 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 no. Hacky Sack told them the cosmic jellyfish didn't have much time, meaning something pretty bad and not easily reversible was happening to them. So what in the heckin' heckery is this about? They just need to fly past non-corrupted extraterrestrial blowpins and they go back to normal? Then what was this about? Was he just trolling them? This brings up yet another major issue on top of the other major issues, but I just assumed that these wisps were always like this. I didn't piece together that they're actually normal wisps that have been drained of all their life force and have corrupted into Halloween decorations. But, as we find out during gameplay, they still have hyperventilation energy to imbue Jake with crazy abilities. In fact, the abilities he's granted by these drained wisps are arguably stronger and better abilities than the normal wisps. So the question is, how do you siphon off a thing's life force and then they turn into something with even more life force than before? For the love of Macy Gray, why does this godforsaken game exist? Because we're down! This means that not only is the script confirmed to actually be allergic to stakes and legitimate threats, not only that Robotnik's plan is even dumber than I previously thought, not only that Yak Attack over here is the biggest troll in the universe, but that Jake and Norman's flippant total disregard for the well-being of the Wisps was in fact rewarded, not punished. They were not aware that the Wisps were OP as fact, so they're still terrible, awful, irrelevant excuses for heroes, but the story itself goes, lol, it doesn't matter, and retroactively removes any and all stakes and threats in the entire story. This Monday to Friday, monkey fighting, gas lighting game literally has no stakes and no threats and no consequences for any of the actions taken or not taken throughout. The entire story has snapped itself in half. Again, again. They all fly up there and defuse the black hole. So not only are they black hole proof, they can control Z black holes too. Fuck all this bullshit! What the fuck? 
Do you understand how powerful and cataclysmic black holes are? Do you understand just how powerful a being has to be to withstand them, let alone cancel them out? The level of power for these creatures is so insane, we're straying into Dragon Ball Z territory. So why couldn't they defend themselves against dopey Robochud and his mechanical menagerie of morons? But okay. Maybe I've jumped the gun. Maybe they're just uniquely tuned to black coal energy or something. So they can deal with singularities, but all other opposition is beyond them. If they're exclusive to black hole maintenance, then they could still be captured by Robotnik and drained of their life force. That kinda makes sense. Right? Terrible! I mean, it's not like they can just do anything, right? Like, they can't just, pff, I don't know, magically fix everything with little effort? Because that would be really... I quit. I quit, I quit, I quit. I quit, I quit, I quit, I quit, I quit, I quit. Never have I craved the cold, nightmarish embrace of death more than in this very moment. This scene, this dumber-than-life, unrelentingly brain-dead sequence of events, this stupefying embarrassment of logical progression has definitively proven that none of this demented train wreck in hell had to happen. The sentient saw squids can do literally anything and literally nothing at the same friggin time the writers wanted creatures for jake to rescue but at the same time wanted a way to keep jake from getting eviscerated in a black hole and also a way to put the technicolor tapeworms planets back where they belong so instead of coming up with a clever way to solve these problems they decided to fundamentally undermine their entire story by making the oversized sperm worms selectively OP. You have rendered your entire story meaningless. Congratulations! Take a bow. Here's a medal, and your ticker tape parade will be tomorrow morning. You bronchitis, laryngitis, cellulitis pert! Sweet Sandra Bullock, it's over. Thank God. God, it's over. The cosmic jellyfish just activate god mode and fix everything. Jake and Norman just stare blankly into the sky, probably questioning why any of this even happened. And that's it. There's nothing left for me to go over. Faster, you idiot! Faster! Put your backsides into it! Technically, we don't have backsides, boss. Right side? A certain someone got their voice back. I feel like my own self! All I wanna do is talk, talk, talk! Hey, remember when we were chasing those little alien guys? What's up with those things anyway? Can we stop this cruel game and allow the boy to keep one shred of dignity? For God's sakes! This is a fate worse than death. If I was Robotnik, I literally would have kicked the glass from the Eggmobile and just let the vacuum of space free me from this torture. You just had to add insult to fatal injury, didn't you, writers? You just had to. Go sit on a belt sander bare-cheeked, you donkey brain troll goblins. Now the game's finally over, thank God. Let's take it from the top. Lazy mode, disengaged. Parts one through three, as long and fun as they are, were intended to be the scene-by-scene -scene destruction of the game. But there are far more elements to dissect, compare, and destroy to definitively vanquish this horrendous beast. There are several things I've referenced and put pins in for later that parts four through six will cover in even more exhaustive detail. So don't worry, there's far more ranting and raging to enjoy Enjoy from this awful game. Be sure to check out part 4, which will be coming much sooner than part 3 did, I promise. Yes, I've been gone a minute, a lot of stuff happened, but I'm finally able to record again, so 
Expect a more regular uploading schedule for a while. The aim is at least one video every three months, but we'll see how well that turns out now, won't we? Because if you haven't noticed, these videos take a long time to make to get them to a level I can be proud of. And I am grateful to any and all of you that are interested in my content. If you would like to support the channel or any of my content and have your name up in the credits like these lovely people here, I do have a Patreon, which is the best way to support. However, if you prefer another avenue, one that is in a monthly commitment, I got you covered with a Ko-fi and Cash App as well. Every little bit helps me to stay funded, motivated, and determined to bring the best content I can to you all. So please, consider supporting the channel on any of these platforms. Links to all of them are in the description. For the non-Sonic side of things, as soon as the Colors rant is complete, I'll be moving back to Sailor Moon for an episode-by-episode -episode analysis of the first season, which is a huge undertaking. But a promise is a promise, and I'm a massage man of my word, so yeah, it's happening very soon. Also, the comic book projects I've referenced a few times are coming together as well. Those will be a lot of fun, as I'll be bringing the same level of rage and thoroughness to the panels of crappy comics as I do to video game stories. So if you're even remotely interested in comic books or superhero content, do stay tuned for those. Plus, even more super secret projects will be sprinkled between Sonic and Sailor Moon videos covering any number of other media that catches my attention. My time off from YouTube has been busy planning all this stuff out. We've got no shortage of content here, trust me. And on that note, I thank you all for watching all the way through, and I'll be seeing you next video. Which, I have to go back to editing. Okay, bye.